Peter chapter 3, Peter has, through his writings, been addressing Christians, encouraging them to remain faithful, encouraging them to be reminded of the words of Christ so that they could in, be faithful, but also that they might endure temptation. And so Peter also spends time warning Christians of the possibility of apostasy, falling away from grace and losing one's salvation. And he concludes in verse 18 of 2 Peter chapter 3, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Obviously, the Bible tells us many ways in which we can grow. But when we look at growth and knowledge and in grace, and we look at how God designed the worship service, we see that many of the aspects of growth exist within our public gathering of together, of worshiping together, to worshiping God together. The Bible tells us uh, that we are to come together to worship. And when we come together, the Bible tells us who the audience of our worship is, the intent of our worship, the purpose of our worship. And when we come together, it tells us what acts of worship we participate in. And we see in those acts of worship that they are directed towards a proper audience, God himself, but in so doing or in practicing those actions together as God commanded and towards the right audience, that we participate in acts that actually bring about spiritual growth, growing in grace, growing in knowledge. When we go back to, all the way back to the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 19, we read of an example of a prophet of God, a, a faithful follower of God, feeling alone. Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah says in verse 14, after he's been teaching the truth, being rejected by those who he thought would follow him, and of course being rejected by those in high power who were seeking to kill him. He says in verse 14, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah, a prophet of God, an inspired author of God, one of uh, God's great messengers, felt alone. And because of his feeling of, of aloneness, being alone, being lonely, it also led him to have some other very discouraging feelings, didn't it? <laughs> it's only me. I've been doing what God said to do. And the people that I thought would be favorable to what I said, they've rejected you. And notice how he references the children of Israel, uh, individuals who are supposed to be God's people, by the way, right? He said, they've forsaken your covenant. It's not that they don't know about it. It's that they've forsaken it. They knew about it, and they've chosen not to do it. And when they forsook the covenant of God, they forsook God. Notice he says, then they've thrown down your altars. That's the means by which God wanted them to worship. In other words, they don't worship God as God wanted them to worship anymore. God commanded them to, to offer certain sacrifices, and they threw down those altars, and many of them didn't quit worshiping. They just weren't worshiping God in spirit and in truth. They threw down the altars of God, what God wanted as worship, and they set up their own altars. They started worshiping how they wanted to worship. Nothing new under the sun, is there? How many people today gather together and worship, but they don't worship as God commanded. They worship as they chose. 
Isaiah's words would say they've forsaken God, the covenant of God, and they've thrown down God's plan of worship and replaced it with their own. So here's a man of God trying to get them to turn back to God, and he feels alone, and he feels discouraged. And he says they've slain other prophets with the sword, and I'm next. That's not a very good feeling, is it? And so obviously God doesn't want us to feel like that even though sometimes that's the case. Those things exist. And you read the very next verse, and it says in verse 15, The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of uh, Shaphat of uh, uh, Abel Maholoth, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room, and it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael uh, shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. You know, if we didn't read on, a person might say, well, God just ignored everything Elijah just said. But he didn't, did he? This was God's answer to Elijah's prayer. The first part was, get up and go to work. Uh, you know, the old cliche, an idle mind is the devil's playground. God, uh, if we stay uh, discouraged too long, we'll, we'll start to fall farther and farther away from doing what God wants us to do. God said, get up. I, you know, I'm not ignoring your prayer, but part number one is whether you like it or not, you need to go back to work. Go do what you're supposed to do. Now notice verse 18. That wasn't the only part of the answer to his prayer. A lot of people don't like God's answers to prayers and they say God didn't answer my prayer. Sometimes it's just we don't like God's answers to prayer. Verse 18 though, Yet I have left me 7,000 into Israel, all the knees which have not bowed down to Baal or the false gods, the false altars, the false worship, and every mouth which hath, kiss, uh, hath not kissed him or is sacrificing praise to the false gods. So this other part of the answer was, you're not alone, isn't it? That was, the, that was the other part of the answer. You're not alone. There's a faithful remnant. Where else do we feel that, see that, hear that, gain that edification and encouragement in this world? It's when we gather together to worship, isn't it? It may seem that way when we're out in the world and working and going to school and things of that nature and just going about our daily life that, you know, Jesus said, I don't want you to take these disciples out of the world. What a horrible world that would be. We need God's word, right? We need individuals going out into the world and preaching the truth. So Jesus didn't pray in John 17 that they take out of the world, that they, that they would be with, that God would be with them, that they not be alone, that they not be alone. In the limited commission, when they were being trained, if you will, God sent them by twos, right? He didn't send them alone. And in the great commission, we're commanded each individually to go, but it doesn't hurt to go out and to help one another in multiples, right? Bible studies, and that's why we have a Bible study on Sunday morning and a Bible study on Wednesday evening to to come together again and to study and not be alone. And so when we come to worship, we gain that edification, that encouragement that we need, knowing that we're not alone. Sometimes we feel alone, but we need to be reminded that we're not. And if we stay away from the worship service long enough, we may get to the point where we really believe that we are alone, like Elijah felt like he was alone. We need to remind ourselves we're not. And we're better to remind ourselves than where we're here when we're together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is addressing some coming together issues that had arisen in uh, Corinth. Indiv uh, individuals, groups of individuals were indeed assembling together and 
afterwards it seems that they would meet for meals, common meals, but they would leave out certain members of the, the assembly. They would meet in cliques, you might say. And so Paul addresses that and compares it to, hey, if you're going to gather together to worship in spirit and in truth and come together, and as we'll show in one aspect, obviously, of the worship, the communion, the Lord's Supper, which we partook of just a moment ago, how can you say you're together, you're united, you're one in taking the communion, and then when you leave the worship service, you divide? We're in this group, you're in that group. We don't hang out with your group. We hang out, you know. And that, believe it or not, as childish as that seems, many of us have seen that happen in congregations, right? So in 1 Corinthians 11, it deals with that. It wasn't nothing new. And so in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, after Paul kind of addresses this in verse 20, he says, when you come together, therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So he was saying, you have come together in one place to worship and to partake of the Lord's Supper. But now, after that a service or after that assembly, you are still together in one place and you're having a common meal, verse 21, for in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper and one is hungry and another is drunken. Uh, what? Have you not houses to eat in and to drink in or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So he's saying, look, if you're going to eat a common meal and you don't want to be with one another, you've got houses to eat in. But if you're going to eat with one another, eat with one another. Don't divide up and, and because that's not the purpose of Christianity, brotherhood, sisterhood, right? But notice how he compares that to, right? This is not an act of worship. So you're not commanded to eat together. <laughs> that's not a command. But you are commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper. And when we, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're commanded to take it in a way that is worthy of God. Not having aught with brothers and sisters in Christ should be one of those ways. But notice when we, when we do meet for the Lord's Supper, one act of worship, notice the, the words that Paul uses in verse 20. You come together. We don't worship by Zoom meetings. Unfortunately, there was a time with COVID, some of us did that because of, it was the best thing that we could do at the time with, a, with an unknown virus, right? And so we did the best we could. But it wasn't, it wasn't good because we need to be together. We need to see one another, hear one another. And that's part of the act of worship is coming together. But also notice, this coming together is further defined into one place. Come together into one place. There are religious denominations and even some in the Church of Christ who are starting to divide services. Uh, you meet in your house and this group will meet in their house and this group will meet in their house. They're dividing the worship assembly. Well, when you divide the worship assembly, you're dividing brethren. They're not getting to see one another, hear one another. You're basically planting and fertilizing division within a church is what you're doing. Because you're saying, These, this group's going to get close to one another, and this group's going to get close to one another, but they're not all going to be close to one another. You're fertilizing division inside your own congregation. And why an eldership would want to do that when they've got plenty enough hard things to deal with is beyond me. The eldership is hard enough. Why would you want to plant division and let people have worship assemblies separate from one another, divide one another into cliques? Because God said when you come together into one place, right? So when we have Bible classes and Bible studies, we may divide up into different rooms and have Bible classes for different ages, but during the worship service, we don't divide. We come together in one place. And we serve and worship God as he had commanded us to do. And that's part of not being alone, isn't it? It's part of not being alone. Just like Elijah felt alone, we don't want our brothers and sisters to feel alone. We don't want ourselves to feel alone. And the best place to take care of that problem is here in the worship service. Hebrews chapter 10, not forsaking ourselves as the manner of some is, right? So 
uh, Elijah said they had forsaken the worship of God. Well, some people forsake the worship of God today. But what, uh, what was the response? That we assemble ourselves together, basically in one place, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11. We assemble ourselves together in one place, and what comes out of that assembly? The Hebrews writer says, exhorting one another. We receive exhortation. If, we, if we're not assembling on a regular basis, we miss out on that exhortation. When the congregations in the New Testament met, we read of Paul, an inspired writer, writing letters saying, please keep me in your prayers. Jesus made a prayer, John 17, we've been studying on Wednesday night, where he prayed for his disciples. The brethren paid, uh, prayed for Peter when he was in distress, Acts chapter 12. Prayer is an act of worship, but it is a, mean of, a means of strengthening and edification, isn't it? How, uh, how important was prayer to Paul when he was out on his missionary journeys and to Peter? and to Jesus himself, knowing that people were praying for these individuals. It was edifying. Peter and Paul and Silas, when they were being in jail or, or wherever they were, they, could they knew people were thinking about them and praying for them, and they received, received strength through an act of worship. When we come together, we also focus on the right thing. Right? We focus on the right thing. Uh, sometimes we, we refer to that song right before the Lord's Supper as a means of making sure that our, our minds are thinking or on the right thing. Now, obviously we want our minds thinking on the right thing as soon as we walk in the door. But singing is one way that we can help make sure of that fact, right? That we can make sure that we're thinking on the right thing. And what are we supposed to be thinking on? Are we supposed to be thinking... Boy, the singing is lousy today, or and it never is here because we've got great song leaders, and uh, uh, or the preaching is lousy, and that might be the case, <laughs> right? I'll I'll open that up. That might, but is that what we're what we're supposed to be thinking on? No, we're supposed to be thinking on the words we're singing, the words that are being prayed, uh, the song we just sang, anywhere with Jesus. Went, away, went along well with what we were just talking about. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not alone, we sang, didn't we? Right? Well, there's a reason for not wanting to be alone. So we come together in one place to worship. We're edified. We're exhorted. We're encouraged. We realize we're not alone. And we focus on the right thing. John chapter uh, 4. Jesus says... God is looking for individuals to worship Him, right? He's looking for individuals to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, we, we emphasize a lot of times that in spirit and in truth, that we have our minds engaged and we're doing it as God commands, and that's important. But it's also equally important to understand that God wants us to worship Him. That's what we're focused on. So when we come together, we know we're thinking on the right thing. When we, uh, we've been commanded to sing, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, verse 16. To sing, making melody in our hearts, right? So we sing with our mind and our brain and our heart, and we offer that as a sacrifice, the sacrifice of praise with our lips, and we praise God through that singing, Hebrews chapter 13. God commands us to sing. He commands us to sing uh, without mechanical instrument of music, only using our voices together, singing in psalms and hymns, and singing one to another. That's reciprocal singing. So we're teaching and admonishing one another through song. Well, you have to be together to do that. <laughs> so we're being admonished, we're being taught, we're being edified, we're being strengthened through singing. So God knew this is a good way to help my people not be alone, and be edified and exhorted one with another when they worship in singing. It also makes God pleased because we're doing what God said to do. We're only doing what God said to do. We praise God by doing what he said to do, and that praise reaches God, and he says, I'm very appreciative of their worship. 
In other words, we didn't forsake God's plan of singing and replace it with playing. We did what God said to do. We didn't throw down the altars of God. We set up what God told us to do and we did it uh, through communion. I just mentioned 1 Corinthians 11, right? We want to be in communion. Well, we have to be together to commune with one another. We also have to be together with God. In commun you can't commune with God if you're doing something other than what God said to do. So when God said, I want you to use unleavened bread, that was a way in which we commune with God. If we use communion, if we use unleavened bread, we're doing what God said to do. We're with him. If we use uh, grape juice, unfermented grape juice, as God commanded, the fruit of the vine, we're communing with God because we're doing what he said to do. So when we replace, we throw that away and replace it with any other thing, we're not communing with God. But also the Lord's Supper is a time when we commune with one another, not just with God and Jesus, but with others as we partake of that Lord's Supper together. And that's 1 Corinthians 11. But that, that unity should exist even beyond the worship service, as we pointed out in 1 Corinthians 11. Getting together and eating outside the worship service, it should, we should be as united as we say we are when we're taking the Lord's Supper. We should be as communion, communed together, united uh, in both as we say we are during the Lord's Supper. So when individuals say, well, I'll come and take the Lord's Supper on this holiday or that holiday, but the other 50 or 51 weeks, as Charles said, we're going to have some extra weeks this, this year. Uh, the other 50 or 51 weeks, there's no communing. Well, guess what? There's no communing when you come on the holiday then either. You can't just commune once or twice and say you're with God or you're with one another. You can't be divided 99% of the time and then say we're together. That goes, that's that idea of uh, uh, agreeing to disagree. You agree on 0.01% and then the rest of it you disagree with and you say you're united. That's foolish. That's not God's plan. So we focus on God, we focus on right worship, singing, praying, teaching, preaching, partaking of the Lord's Supper, giving, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 of our means, uh, giving so that we can make it possible that we grow our worship service so that we can have more people to be with and so that they can be encouraged, exhorted, edified. It's not just for the sake of growth. We don't just want individuals in seats or pews just to say we've got a large number. There's a lot of that in the religious world today. It doesn't do any good to have a room full of people who don't believe or want to obey God. So we want a room full of people, but we want converted people, people that want to hear about God, people that want to do what God says to do. And that's our mission is to go into the world and preach the gospel and convert them, have them be baptized uh, in water to become a new creature because that's what they want to do. And we preach the word and we teach the word through our worship service. It is possible and it's obviously commanded that we read the Bible at home, study on our own, but it's much different than hearing the gospel preached from a pulpit, even if it's a bad sermon. <laughs> it's better than no sermon at all, right? Because we receive something out of it. We receive something out of it. Hearing the word preached is beneficial. We may not realize it at the time that we hear it, but it is beneficial. It might be something that we're reminded of later. It's something that can help us grow spiritually, and that's where we bounced off of, grow in grace and knowledge. And we see that we can do that by just coming here and worshiping God in spirit and in truth. The Word gives us spiritual strength. It's a light that guides us on our way. Psalm uh, 119, um, 150. In Psalm 119, at the, the beginning of that psalm, Psalm 119, uh, verse 9, beginning, 
The psalmist says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? How do we make sure we're right, walking the right path, the clean way, if we're doing according to God's word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Well, how do we seek God? Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. What's it mean to seek God? He says, oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. People say, I need more God. I need to be closer to God. How do we get closer to God? Seek his word. When you hear, if, the, if there's the gospel being preached, go hear it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. A lot of people say, I need more faith. Romans 10, 17 says, go hear the word of God then. If your faith is weak, go hear the word of God preached. That's how you get faith. Uh, verse 11, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Once again, the word of God being referenced in different ways, commands, statutes. Uh, verse 13, with my lips have I declared all thy judgments. Judgments are things that are right. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies, lessons, instruction. As much as in all riches, I will meditate in thy precepts, and I have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Verse 15, I will have respect unto thy ways. The key uh, way to know if you respect God's way is if you're doing it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If a person says, like verse 15, uh, I have respect for God and his ways, don't just say it, show it. If you really respect God and his ways, you'll be doing things God's way, not your way. And then verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes, I will not forget thy word. We talked in our Bible study this morning about how easy it is to forget things. You know how you not forget the Word of God? You come hear it over and over again. And you read it over and over again. You study it over and over again. Very important. So, how, if we, how better to remind ourselves of that than in the worship service when we get to hear the preaching of the gospel, being taught and admonished through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then... Uh, outside of a worship service, but in a Bible class where we have additional teaching, right? The Word teaches us, as Psalm 119 shows us, everything we need to know that God wants us to know, right? Judgments, instruction, Paul even said that in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Word of God is profitable for instruction, for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for exhortation. The Word of God is the answer. And we can find the answer. The most important question anybody has ever asked is, what must I do? Acts chapter 2, and henceforth. <laughs> and the answer was given. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. If you want to get rid of your sin, here's how you do it. I don't know for a fact, but I've been told by the preacher that was preaching there, many of you know him, that when I was three or four, I had memorized Acts 2, verse 38. Now, I probably couldn't read at the time, but you know why I memorized it, if, if that's the case? I heard it every Sunday. Do you want your children to grow up in the ways of the Lord? Let them hear it over and over again. And if they fall away, they still know it. They've heard it so many times, right? It's an opportunity uh, that, to plant that in their head all, as much as possible. I didn't know what Acts 2.38 meant when I was three or four, but I could remember. I, I had heard it over and over and over again, and I heard it all up into the point to where I did know what it meant, and I obeyed it. And that's why it's not bad to hear things over and over again. But, we, but I heard that in the worship service. You know, you, I wonder if my, if my parents had divided me out from the worship service, when would I have memorized Acts 2.38? Would I have? 
I'd like to say yes, but you don't know. So the greatest question that anybody can ever ask can be answered in the worship service. Somebody, uh, some people may not know that I can find that answer, or they, maybe they've been taught a lie, but by coming to hear the Word of God preached, they can at least hear the answer to that question. The Word of God tells us that it was sin that separated us from God. We weren't born evil, as many in the denominational world teach Calvinistically. The Bible tells us that we were innocent little children born into the world and that when we came to an ability to know the difference between right and wrong, we chose wrong at one point in time, and that separates us from God. It continues to separate us from God until we repent and are baptized under the New Testament age. So it tells us about how we enter sin through our actions or inaction. It tells us how to get back with God, repent and be baptized. It reveals to us what made that possible God gave his only begotten son. We wouldn't even know about Jesus if it weren't for the word. It reveals to us Jesus' plan. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Believe, repent, confess, be baptized. Remain faithful even to the point of death, Revelation 2 verse 10. And if you do all these things, you'll receive a crown of life. It, re it tells us how to get saved, how to stay saved, uh, and... How long we have to be faithful to God, right? Until the end. But there is the, an end and there is assurance. Be faithful unto the end and you'll receive a crown. Assurance. Something to look forward to. All that comes from the worship service. So we can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. There's lots of other things that we could look at. But look at how the worship service God set up allows us to do that for one another, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hopefully this was a, a beneficial lesson. Hopefully it was encouraging, uh, maybe a way in which you can uh, teach others, thinking of how to grow through assembling together and worshiping God, just doing what he says to do. If we can be of any other assistance to you, Come now as we stand and sing. Um.